and resume. So for the ISLO assignment, make sure that you, one, complete the whole form, and two, that you enter the identifying information correctly. So the three things that you're going to need are your instructor's name, first name, and last name, which I've given it to you here. Um, you're going to need your banner ID that you'll have to look up to find it. And then you're going to need your course um, CRN, the course number, the course name or title. Goes, as well as the section number. Okay, so I did put that information here. The CRN is 11120. The course that we're in is Math 1314, and then the section number is just 062. Okay, but be careful. Make sure when it comes to the name part, you are selecting my name from a drop down arrow and not typing in my name. Okay, you have to type in your name. So if I come down here to the actual part where you complete the assignment, I'll go over those in a second. This where it says first name, last name, that is your name. So make sure that you're typing your name in that box. You type in your banner ID. And then your ACES ID is whatever, I think it's like your first initial, your last name, and then maybe some numbers. Um, that's what you use when you log into ACES, right? It'll be that ACES ID and then at student.alamo.edu. Okay, so that's that will be what you type in there. Then here's where you type in that one 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 eight zero or two zero, whatever the number was. Here's where you select the math thirteen fourteen, and then here's where you would type in the zero six two. Okay, all of that has to be correct in order for me to get the email that says you did it. Okay, and then you have to select your my name from in here, so it's right there. Okay. Um, once all of this top part is filled out correctly, then I'll know that you did it. I won't be grading the rest of it, but I do want you to do your computations here for each scenario. And then they want you to write a paragraph on whatever the problem is. So let me go through it real quick. So the scenario is, is a friend of yours is looking to buy a car, an SUV, a van, or a truck. And the financing departments of multiple dealerships have offered them the following mail uh, offers or uh, offers during when they visited the dealership. And so this dealership called Great Cars has this offer, $3,200 down with a six year contract but for $370 a month. All interest and finance charges and everything are calculated in the payment. So please don't try to make it more complicated than it is. You will literally just add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Um, you may have learned like interest formulas from a different class or something like, you're not going to use none of those there. <laughs> it's just add, subtract, multiply, and divide. That's as much as I could tell you. Um, and then this uh, dealership gives them this kind of offer. Um, Copper choppers suggest buying a motorcycle um, and they give you those informations. Happy Motors offers this information on a truck. Okay. So, um, and this one was on a car and this one was any automobile. So just keep that in mind as you are uh, working on these things. So you'll kind of figure out what's going on. And then I think the bottom asks you, what does it say? It's like, it says based on the information and your computations that you did in the top part, write at least one paragraph explaining what you advise your friend to consider when choosing their preferred model of car, truck, SUV, van, and why. So basically, which dealership should they go with and why, okay? Um, and there's the spot for you to do all your calculations for each dealership, okay? And again, you're only doing add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Maybe you might need the equal sign, so you could use the regular symbols, the plus, the minus, the little asterisk for times, and then the forward slash for divide, okay? Um, but you should be able to type everything in there. Now, there is a little video, and I did get tasked with the one that had to record the video, so it's me. <laughs> and no matter what class someone was taking, I'm right here. Um, but I don't have to watch it because I kind of already explained <laughs> everything. Um, but it is there in case you forget. You can click on it, and it'll tell you how to fill out the form, and it'll talk about, you know, typing in your computations and all that good stuff, okay? Once I receive an email stating that you did it and it'll show me everything that you did. So as long as the whole form is complete, all your computations are in there, you wrote your little paragraph, 
um, then I will go and make sure that I jot down to add 10 points to your test two score, okay? So this is going to be a different extra credit assignment from um, a previous extra credit assignment. And I'm not sure if I mentioned it in this class, I might have, um, but we had a speaker, uh, an engineer come and talk to our students and we recorded it. And I am still working on creating a quiz for that presentation. And once I have that quiz ready and the video ready, um, I will post it to our class and then you'll be able to watch the video and it's about maybe 30 minutes long. It's not too long. You'll be able to watch the presentation and then answer the quiz questions. And if you get 100 on the quiz, then you'll um, be able to uh, get 10 points towards your test three score, okay? So there'll be another um, extra credit opportunity. And then just FYI, in case anyone was curious, because um, sometimes it happens where, you know, you may have, done better on certain tests than others. And at the end of the semester, I usually replace folks lowest test grade with their final exam score. And so when that happens, I personally float bonus points. So what that means is like, let's say, you know, you did both of the extra credits on test one and test three, and you got 10 points bonus for both of those tests. But when I did the grade replacement, Maybe test two was your, your worst uh, test score. And so that one got replaced. Well, what I do is I take those 10 bonus points and I just put them on another test so that you could still keep your 10 bonus points, if that makes sense, okay? So I float the bonus points around so that it benefits you, right? You wanna have more points than less, okay? Um, and the reason why I do that is because a lot of times with math, specifically with math, I don't know about other Clark, classes I've never taught any other class um but a lot of times like I can see you know based on people's questions based on what they do on the test like where your skill level is at but because we get a lot of complaints from students on like well why is my grade this and why is my grade that we had to start creating these like rubrics where I have to tell you exactly like where every single point is coming from when I grade your test and so when I use those rubrics, a lot of the times what happens is that your grades don't reflect your knowledge. And I, I know how to get around it. And that's if I had the liberty to just put whatever score I wanted, um, because I'm like, hey, you demonstrated pretty much what you understood here. So you get like eight points. Oh no, this doesn't really explain anything. That's only three points, right? Um, versus when I do the rubric, you're getting like a point here, a point there, a point there, a point there. You may have absolutely no idea what's going on, but somehow you got four points. Or you may have known exactly how to do it, but you made a few tiny little errors and now you have lesser points than the other guy. So it gets really complicated. <laughs> so to balance that out, I usually try to like replace grades. I try to float around bonus points. I do lots of weird stuff because I really think that students' grades should reflect their skill level. And all of those little things that I do only ever benefit the student. So no matter what I do to the grades, um, it's never gonna bring somebody's score down a notch. It might bring some people's grades up a notch or two, but it will never bring people's grades down. I just, that's, that's not ethically right in my opinion, okay? If you got the points, you got the points, right? But if there's ways to put other points in other places, then I try my best to do that, okay? Um, normally, things, things usually work out toward the end, which is why I always try to <laughs> like prevent students from dropping um, because things might look scary throughout the process, but then once the final exam comes and I start getting to mess around in there and see where I can put the points and where to shift them, um, things start looking better, but it's not until after you take the final exam, okay? Um, so, and I have had it happen where somebody had a D the whole semester and then I go in there and I start moving things around and now all of a sudden they have a B. Um, and so it just depends on, on that, okay? Um, but I just wanted to make that announcement. You can get some 10 points on test two and you will be able to get 10 points on test three for um, the lecture series, okay? So once you get the video up there. Now, today we're going to actually cover um, the rest of 3.4, and then we'll go into 3.5, okay? So for here, 
With 3.4, we left off with example four. So I'm gonna go ahead and start that one. And this one's actually a little bit nicer, I guess, than the previous example, because in the previous example, we had to factor it, right? And on this example, it looks like it's already all nicely factored and set up and ready to go. So according to the rules of last class, in order for me to find my x-intercepts, you have to take your function and equal it to zero. Okay, so it's like making this y value zero. And so then I end up with this equation. And in order for me to solve for x in this equation, I'm going to have to essentially set each one of these parentheses equal to zero. But when you do that, you have x minus 1 equal to 0, x minus 3 equal to 0, and x plus 2 equal to 0. You're always going to have to move that number to the other side, right? So you always end up with the opposite value, OK? So that ends up becoming a positive 3. And this x value ends up becoming a negative 2, OK? So then. In order for me to keep going, not only do I have to have the x-intercepts, but I also have to know the multiplicity. And so we talked about the multiplicity, and we said multiplicity comes from the exponent on the factor, okay? So for this factor, I do have an obvious multiplicity of two, but for this factor, there's no obvious one there, but if you, basically make the invisible visible, it actually has a one exponent, right? And the same thing for this factor, it has a one exponent, which means that this x-intercept has a multiplicity of one, and so does this x-intercept, okay? We also discussed last time that if the multiplicity is one, then the graph actually crosses through that um, x-intercept, so it'll cross through this one. But if your multiplicity is two, then it only like touches or bounces off of the x-intercept, okay? So it won't go through, it'll just bounce. Now we don't know if it's bouncing from the top or bouncing from the bottom. That will just depend on how the rest of the graph looks, okay? So the next step, it was down here, but I kind of, wanted to fit everything in one screen. <laughs> so I just erased step two and I wrote step two up here. And step two from last class was to find the y-intercept. So for finding the y-intercept, that's the opposite. You don't set y equal to zero. When you're finding the y-intercept, you make x equal to zero. So when I plug in zero there, I basically end up with negative times negative one times negative three times two squared. And if we follow our orders of operations, or if you type that whole thing in your calculator, you'll get the square first is four, and then negative times a negative is positive one, positive one times negative three is negative 12, and negative 12 times that four is negative 48, okay? So we get a really large, um, y-intercept there. And I'm going to grab my calculator and just verify because that does seem like it's really big. So I'm going to make sure that that's actually the value. And I didn't do something funny, right? So see, I just entered the whole thing, right? You didn't even need to do this part. I just entered the whole thing and see, I was wrong. Oh, because that was not four. It was positive one times negative three is negative three. And then negative three times four is negative 12. I told you my brain does weird stuff. <laughs> Especially after, this is my second class for the day. So after coming out of the calculus class, yeah, my brain gets a little jumbled. So now we have it. And that makes more sense because look at this graph paper. It doesn't go all the way to 48, right? But I could definitely go to negative 12, not a problem. It's just two little more tiny boxes, okay? But I do need some more information first. So we do need to figure out the end behavior. 
And then we need to figure out the maximum turning points. Now, in behavior comes from that leading term, right? From the a x to the n term, the one term that has the highest exponent. And it's super easy to see when the function is in its general form like this, like our previous example, right? Our previous example, the function was in its general form and it's real easy to see who has the highest exponent, right? And so it's easy to figure out who the, what the end behavior is. But when it's written like this in its factored form, it's not that simple to just eyeball the um, leading term. So in order for us to get the leading term, we're still gonna use our A value, which is here in the front, which is a negative one. But if I wanna know what the highest exponent is, you essentially just add all of these exponents together. So if I take X to the one times X to the one, that's gonna be X squared. And if I multiply that by another X squared, I actually get X to the fourth. So you're just adding one plus one plus two to get that exponent. Okay, so I'm going to write a little note here. And we get this by adding all the exponents of the factors. Or another way of saying that is by adding all the multiplicities together. right? Because those are the same numbers. So if you already identified your multiplicities, you're just adding all those numbers together. So now that I know what my leading term looks like, this is a negative a value and the exponent is an even. And according to that chart that we showed in the last class, the end behavior should actually be going downward on both ends. And then the max turning points comes from the highest exponent minus one. So four minus one means I'm gonna have a maximum of three turning points. That does not mean that I will have three turning points. It just means I won't have any more than three turning points. I could have no turning points, one turning point, two turning points, or three, okay? So when we're here, we're gonna go ahead and see what we have, and then we'll go ahead and see if we need any extra points. So for our x-intercepts, we have one, we have three, and we have negative two. And for our y-intercept, we had negative 12. So I will have to go down to negative 11, negative 12, and put that dot there. Now I know that it's gonna go downward on both ends. So I know from here it's gonna go down, but we need to figure out what it's doing here. So if I'm coming up this way, cause it has to come from the bottom, right? If I'm coming up this way, I'm supposed to be bouncing at negative two, which means as I go here, it will bounce off of that and then go downward, okay? Now, how far down does it go? It's gonna have to, am I gonna go down and then turn to go through here? Or am I gonna go through there and then turn on this side? That we don't know. And so we will have to figure out some more points here. So I would definitely plug in negative one and then something in between here like 0 0.5 positive. And where does that go? It goes in the original function, right? So that we could figure out the Y values. So let me see there. I'm gonna do negative one stores X because I don't know how many um, X values I'm gonna have to plug in. So I stored my first one and then negative parentheses X minus one, X minus three and X plus two squared. And I hit enter and I get negative eight. So that's gonna be my Y back. Then for me to do this one, I'm gonna do 0 0.5 store X, go back to that expression, copy, and then plug it in. It's about 7.8, but I'm just gonna put the whole decimal. 
So that helps me because now I know how far we're going, right? So on this side, I'm only going to here. And then on this side, I'm at negative 7.8. So it's kind of close. So it does look like, I can't even tell really. I, I'm thinking it goes through there and does that, but I'm not sure exactly. It's supposed to be half and 7.8. So about right there. So I might need one more. I might need to put in negative 0.5. In the computer, you usually have multiple choices, so that's really nice, because then you don't have this complication of really trying to figure out where that goes. You just look at the pictures and it'll tell you. Uh, see, I knew something was happening. So this one goes down to 11.8, which is about right there. So it does seem like it's going just to that point and then coming back up through there. Now, I am supposed to cross through x equals 1, so I'm going to go right through there. And then I know I'm supposed to end up downward, so at some point I'm going to have to turn and then cross through 3. But how high up does this go? I don't know. So let's plug in one of those x values in between, which is 2. So I'm going to do 2 store x and plug him in, and I get 16. Well, that's like way off the chart. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. It's like way up there. Well, we're gonna have to go way up there and then all the way back down and then go downward, okay? This is not a pretty graph. <laughs> it's just pretty much a sketch, um, but that's normally what they ask you to do. Now, if, um, if you're given multiple choices, then you just need to figure out which of those multiple choices looks a lot like what you've tried to draw, okay? Or like on the test, as long as you have all the pieces of information on your paper, like you have your x-intercepts, your multiplicity, your in behavior, your turning points, that's enough for me to know that you can click on the right graph, okay? Um, you just have to find the graph that matches all of that information that you found, okay? So you don't necessarily need to draw it on the paper if it's multiple choice on the test, okay? Um, but you definitely need to be able to tell which one's which. And some of the graphs are going to have all the same information. They're going to have the same x-intercepts, the same crossing and bouncing situations, the same in behavior, and the same max turning points. However, you might have one graph that goes way up there at two and another one that just goes a little bit over two. And so in order for you to figure out which one of those two graphs it is, you would need to have a table, okay? Just so that you have confirmation as to which one it is. Or at least write on your paper how you knew it was one of those versus the other one with the same exact information, okay? Just be like, hey, I plugged in two into the function and I got five, not 16. So it shouldn't be way up there, okay? Okay, I mentioned this little text box in the last class, but finally they decided to tell it to us in the notes. So remember, these are all like the same thing. Whether you're saying x-intercept, you're saying the word zero, okay? Another word I've heard is root which is weird because we use those for radicals, but I've heard those words before. Solutions, right? And then factors. So they all correlate. So if you have a number, an x-intercept at some number, they called the number C, okay? That's what they labeled it. So this number is called the zero. That number is also a solution or an answer if you were to set the function equal to zero, and that point is an x-intercept of the graph, right? We also know that x minus that number or the opposite sign is also a factor. We kind of talked about that when we were doing this problem, right? Normally I don't write these steps right here. Normally when I have the parentheses like that, I just use the opposite. So the x-intercept is positive one. Here the x-intercept would be positive three. And here the x-intercept would be negative two, okay? 
And that's because of that relationship between the number and then the factor having opposite signs, right? Here, it looks like it's positive, but in there, it looks like it's negative. And if the number was negative, when you minus a negative, it's plus, right? So it's always the opposite. Now, we do not cover boundedness or the intermediate value theorem in this class. So that page, the bottom part of this page, it should be X'd out. The next page as well should be X'd out. Um, and even the next page should be X'd out. This is has to do with polynomial models and things like that, okay? And there's none in the homework I saw. So it looks like that's the end of 3.4. However, there are some problems in your homework that are not in this note packet, okay? And so I wanted to make sure that we talked about these examples so that way you could figure them out when you're doing your um, homework, okay? So for all of these problems, it's three of them, I pick three, and, and they kind of do the opposite for us. They, instead of telling us the function and asking us to graph it, they want us to do the reverse. So they're gonna give us the graph and then they want, excuse me, they want us to find the function, okay? So we have to have basically a template, okay? So we can know where to put everybody, okay? So here's your template. My template is gonna be a function with the coefficient and then X minus the first X intercept with the multiplicity of that X intercept x minus the second x-intercept with his multiplicity, and so on and so on. Just multiply them all together, okay? So if I have three x-intercepts, then I will have three parentheses. If I have one x-intercept, I'll just have one parentheses. If I have two, then I'll have two parentheses, so on and so forth, okay? So for this one, we can go at it right away. I don't know what a is. We'll have to figure that out, but we'll do it in a minute. I see I have three x-intercepts. So that tells me I'm going to have three parentheses, okay? Now, this x-intercept, I have one, two, three, four, five, six. So these units are going by ones, right? So this x-intercept is at negative four, which means when I go in here, remember the relationship. If the x-intercept is negative four, you don't plug negative four in there, you plug the opposite. So I would put positive four in here. This x-intercept is at two, which is positive, but when I put it in there, I have to use the opposite. This x-intercept is at five, but when I put it in the parentheses as a factor, I have to do the opposite. Now the multiplicities, I have to include those, okay? So this one's crossing, which means that x-intercept will have a one. This one's crossing, and so is that one. So all of them will have a one exponent, okay? And you don't ever have to write the one exponent. The problem here is, is I still don't know what A is, okay? A is gonna be the hard part. So we do have this extra point right here. And I don't know, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six. And this is 60, so it would make sense that that's 20, okay? So then that point, the, the coordinates of this point is zero for X, but up 20 for Y. And so if I use this point, okay, I can plug in these two numbers into this equation and calculate what A is. So all the X's, will become zero, and I don't have to write a one exponent. And the function value, remember this is a fancy way of saying y, the y is 20. So this side of the equation will become 20. So let's multiply all of this out. I'm gonna end up with a times some number, zero plus four, zero minus two, and zero minus five. If you could do that in your head, fantastic. If not, we have our calculator, right? I get 40. 
So if I want to solve for A, since A is being multiplied by 40, to get A by itself, we have to get rid of the 40. So we'll do the opposite of multiplying, which is to divide by 40. And then this fraction most likely reduces. If you're not fantastic at reducing, you can put it in the calculator, right? And it'll reduce it for you. So we do get one half. That is all I needed to give them my final answer. My final answer is gonna be this exact same thing, but with the one half. And I don't have to write in the ones. It's not standard procedure to write one exponents, okay? So this is our final answer for that one. Now we do have two days to cover 3.5 and 3.5 is not that long. It's, it's indifferent, it's, it's new stuff. It's graphing fraction stuff. Um, fraction functions, but it's not anything too, too crazy, but we do have two days. So I'm not trying to like super rush through um, 3.4 or 3.5, okay? So just go as we go and then get as far as we can get. So let's look at this one here. This one only has two x-intercepts, which means I'll only have two parentheses, okay? And there always is an X right here. And then let's see what this one, one, two, three, four, five, six. So these look like they're going by ones. So that makes that a negative five and it makes this one, one, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, yeah, so this one's right on the three. So when they go in here though, right, they become the opposite. So instead of negative five, this will become plus five. And instead of positive three, this will be negative three. Now the multiplicities though, this one goes through negative five. So the five will have a one because it crosses right through it. But this one bounces off of it, okay? And when it bounces, it should have an exponent of two. So it's a little bit different. We hadn't had one with an uh, exponent of two. But we still need to figure out the A. So we still need to know the coordinates of this point. Um, the X value is zero, but the Y value, I'm not sure. One, two, three, four, five marks to get to 15. So I think they're going by threes, right? Three, six, nine, 12, 15, yeah. So that makes that point at six. So remember, this is your X, this is your Y. So the Y is going to become the six and all the X's are going to become zero. And again, you can use your calculator there to find that little number. So zero plus five, zero minus three squared. This is 45. And then to solve for A, we have to divide by 45. And let's see if that reduces. Oh, it does. We get two over 15. So our final function is gonna be this exact same function. I just don't have to write the one, but I know what the A is now. I'm sorry, is it six or nine? Oh, thank you. It, what should it be? I thought it would be nine. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and I said nine when I pointed at it, right? <laughs> but then I wrote down six. I'm telling you, my brain's mush right now. Okay. So that's okay. It's not going to change too, too much, but we definitely wanted to have the right numbers, right? So let's put that guy right here. And then I'll enter that in my calculator again, because it'll probably reduce different, right? Good catch. Thank you. So we have one over five, perfect. So then my A is not two over 15, right? Our A should be one over five. And then this guy won't write the little one. 
But this one, I have to write the two. Two is different, right? Two is not invisible. Never does it go invisible. So we definitely have to write the little two. Well, who what, was that, Quantrini? Yes, it was me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Quantrini. Okay, let me put this one there in case you're trying to, it's hard to draw. I mean, you can see I was struggling to draw it too. Um, I had to like erase and, and it was just a mess. But if you're trying to draw that one, there it is. So this one's interesting. I did see one in the homework that was kind of like it. So I wanted to make sure we talked about it. Um, and even just to kind of recap, recap, right? Before I go into that one, remember this is a positive, right? And you have a one exponent and a two exponent, which is a three. So it's a positive odd function. And this is exactly what the end behavior looks like on a positive odd exponent. For this one, it's going up. And the only way it can go up is if you have a positive coefficient and you have an even exponent, okay? So when we start putting our, our setup, it should match that same kind of concept. We should end up with a positive A and we should end up with an even exponent after adding all the multiplicities together, okay? But I only have two x-intercepts for this one. So when I do my template, I'm only going to need to have two parentheses. Now, over here, it looks like they're going by ones, right? One, two, three. So this should be negative two. And the same thing here, one, two, three. So this one should be positive two. And when I put them in there, they're going to go opposite, right? And then that one's going to go in here, and it's going to be a minus instead of a plus. Here's the weird one. This is not going straight through and is definitely not bouncing, right? This one is doing the wiggle, okay? So it's like going in one, it's called concavity, but it's going like in one concavity, like a bowl, right? Over here on this side, but then it's going like a downward bowl on the other side or like a hill, okay? So when it does that, it changes its little concavity. That's called the wiggle. Okay, so it doesn't go straight through. It kind of looks, if you zoom in just right here, it almost looks like a cubic function where it's going this way and then downward that way, okay? And so when it looks like a little cubic right there, you should be using a three exponent for the wiggles. Same thing here, if I cover that, it looks like a cubic. It goes like a downward parabola and then an upward parabola, that's a wiggle. And so for the wiggles, we have to put the three exponent. We don't have a choice. And if it's just going straight, then that's okay. Like these, right? This one's just going straight through it. It was, there's no thing. It just looks like one big parabola, right? Um, these are different. It looks like half of a parabola and then half of a different parabola. So definitely have to kind of really pay attention to right there what's going on to to see the wiggles okay but once we have the wiggles we're going to do the same thing as before we're going to use that y-intercept okay now for this one um one two three so it looks like this is at negative two here so the point right there is zero for x and negative two for y so that means this guy is going to become negative two, and all the x's are going to become zero. And I'm going to type all of that in my calculator, especially because it's got the cubes, right? So I'm going to do zero plus two to the third power. I can put it over here, get down from there and then zero minus two raised to the third power. And I get negative 64. So then it's multiplied, so we get rid of it by dividing. 
And if I type this in my calculator, you should get positive one over 32, yeah. Don't freak out if it's weird or it's a big number or anything like that. You just do the math and what it is, it is, okay? It can sometimes be a fraction. It can sometimes be a negative fraction. It can sometimes be a whole number, just a regular whole number or even a negative whole number. You just find that number and divide by it and whatever A ends up being, that's the A, okay? But it is positive, right? And we said, because it's both going up, it should be a positive. We also said that the, uh, the exponent would have to be even. Well, guess what? When you add that exponent with that exponent, you get six, right? And it is even. So this does fit all of the information that we know about the behavior of these functions. So it's kind of like a quick check to see if like, what am I on the right track, right? Does it go up? I have a positive and an x to the six that should go both go up. So you definitely have to have two pieces of information with you. Um, definitely have the, uh, well, I mean, it'll be in the test, but when you're doing the homework, you want to know what the end behaviors look like, right? So like the positive x to the odd, negative x to the odd, positive x to the even, negative x to the even, what those behaviors look like. And then you also want to know how to find your x-intercepts and your y-intercepts. And then you also need to uh, know how to get the multiplicity, right? Uh, multiplicity of one means it crosses and vice versa. Uh, multiplicity of two means it just bounces. It just touches it and then goes back the other way. Um, and then the wiggling is multiplicity of three. Okay. Those are the only ones. We won't ever have four or six or five or anything weird. It's just one, two, or three. That's it. Okay. So that is the end of 3.4. So that one should have now a new deadline of this Friday. Um, and I think 3.5 might also, but it might not. I have to double check. Okay. Because I don't think we're going to finish 3.5 and we have two days to cover it. Okay. We don't have to finish it all today. So 3.5 is going to kind of extend everything that we learned in 3.4. So 3.4 was all about polynomials, but as soon as you put a polynomial in the numerator and then you stick another polynomial in the denominator, it's no longer called a polynomial. It's then called a rational function. Okay. And so 3.5 is all about our rational um, functions. So if I go here, and this one has some little boxes and whatnot. I was looking at my notes from the previous semester and I didn't even cover the boxes, but I just thought they might be worth looking at this time around. Um, we will talk about the reciprocal function, which is this guy, um, the same thing. We'll even talk about one over x squared because that one's interesting. Um, and then other than that, we'll just start talking about asymptotes and then we'll learn how to graph them. I don't know that we have any models. I don't think we do, but when we get to that page, if it's X'd out, then, then we don't. <laughs> so we'll get to there. I don't think we're gonna get to that today, but we'll, we'll just keep going, see how far we get. So, uh, the definition of a rational function is literally one polynomial over the other, right? It says P and Q are polynomials, okay? However, we know that from the previous sections, when you talk about domain, right, your denominator can never be zero because then it makes the whole fraction undefined, okay? And so that's all they're saying here is that that bottom polynomial should not ever equal zero, okay? Wherever it does equal zero, whatever x values make that denominator zero, those x values are not going to be included in your domain, right? Your domain will be everything else, but whatever those x values are, okay? And I think we saw that when we were doing 
I can't remember what section it was. I think it was 2.6, 2 2.7, one of those two. When we were adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing the functions, right? And then they kept asking us about domains. And every now and then we'd get a fraction problem and we'd have to find the domain of that fraction problem, okay? So the same situation here, you will have to keep finding the domains. Um, so let's look at the basic information. We've seen this before when we did 2.5, I believe, because one over X is one of those basic uh, functions. And then you can shift them to the left, to the right, up, down, all that good stuff, okay? Um, they can get more complicated than just one over X, which is why we have like a whole section about these guys all by themselves, okay? But I do want to point out before we start learning about asymptotes, there's one quick thing that I have to mention because it happens a lot, okay? When we start talking about what a vertical asymptote is and what a horizontal asymptote, and it starts mentioning it here, which is why I mentioned this comment here. Um, a vertical asymptote is basically a vertical line that your graph never crosses, ever, ever, ever. You can never cross a vertical asymptote. And some people want to extend that concept into the horizontal asymptotes, but it doesn't work that way. Horizontal asymptotes can be crossed, okay? So you can cut through a horizontal asymptote. However, a horizontal asymptote is really just telling us where the far left and the far right of the graph will go, okay? And it won't touch it or cross it far to the left and far to the right. So notice here, all the way to the left, it's getting really close to that x-axis, but it won't ever touch it all the way over here to the left. And on this far right-hand side, again, it's getting really close to the x-axis, but it will never actually touch it on that far right. You will have some graphs later that do this. I'll erase it in a second. So let's say I had a, a horizontal asymptote here. It might do this and then trail off and then trail off like that. And so notice that it does cross the horizontal asymptote, but the end is still trailing, okay? So that's why we have to make sure that we make people aware of that. Or if you had two vertical asymptotes, let's say you had two of these little vertical dotted lines, um, you might have you know, this side doing that, this side doing this, and then in the middle, it might do that. And so again, you're crossing that horizontal asymptote but the end is trailing off toward it and the end over here is trailing off toward it. And that's what makes it a horizontal asymptote, okay? It just never crosses it on the very, very end. Okay, let me erase all that. <laughs> it's not interfering with this stuff. And so if you plugged in all of these X values into this function, they will pop out these Y values, okay? Same thing with these positives. If you plug them in there, they'll pop out these. If you notice, they're just reciprocals of one another, okay? Um, but when you try to plug in zero, you can't. The calculator tells you error, okay? And that's because one over zero is undefined. And so they just write undefined. And the reason that it's undefined is because there's that asymptote right there that you can't ever touch, right? So of course, you're never gonna have a Y value there. You can never touch that Y axis. Okay, so our domain here is going to be all the way to the left, negative infinity, up until this pink asymptote. It never, ever touches zero. It gets really, really, really close, but never actually touches it. So it goes from negative infinity to zero, but notice there's no bracket around the zero because it never touches the zero. Okay, and then the same thing on the other side. This one gets real, real close to it and then it gets all the way to the right. So it starts at zero, real close to zero, not exactly at zero, but then it goes all the way to the right, which is positive infinity. The range, the Y values go downward forever. So they go toward negative infinity. And the highest Y value that this section gets to is just before zero, the Y value zero. 
So there's that ending. This other side though, picks up on the positive side of zero and then it goes up to positive infinity. So that's where this interval comes from. Now, if you look at this thing, if I trace it, this section here on this interval, this interval right here, it actually goes downward when I trace it. So it decreases on this interval. And if I were to go to this interval and trace it, it also goes downward the entire time as you go from left to right. So on both of those intervals, the graph is decreasing. Even though it went from down here all the way to up there, it doesn't matter. You're looking at each section independently. And it does have a discontinuity. Discontinuities are when there's like holes or when there's breaks in the graph. And there's definitely a break here, right? It goes from all the way down there to all the way up here. So that's a break there. And that's happening at the X value zero. And then here we talk about the y-axis is pink, right? That's my vertical asymptote. And the x-axis is our blue line, which is our horizontal asymptote. We didn't talk too much about even and odd functions or symmetry. So we really don't deal with this statement down here too much. Although I just wanted to fill in the blanks there in case you were curious but it's an odd exponent, which makes it an odd x uh, function. And if I were to fold the paper right over the x-axis and then fold it over the y-axis, this section would land right on top of that section, making it have symmetry with respect to the origin. Again, I kind of briefly talked about it, but it doesn't show up anywhere on any homework, any test, any final, nothing. So we're not going to graph these. They kind of just wanted you to see, oh, remember if you multiply by two, it makes it narrow. If you multiply by a negative, it flips it upside down, right? Here, if you multiply it by two, it makes it narrow. And if you add one down there, it's actually gonna shift it to the left, okay? So that's kind of what they were. the goal was to show you here, but they're gonna do all kinds of things to our functions. It's not gonna be as simple as this. So we'll learn how to graph them in general, okay? And then we'll apply it to some graphs like this, to some functions like that. So the other function we wanted to look at was the one over x squared. And it almost looks exactly like the other one. It's just a lot more steep, okay? So notice that this side is not like this. It's way more steep, but it's still, Actually, this side's the same. It still goes like this. The other one did too. But on the other graph, it went downward like that, right? Notice that this time it's up there. Why is it up there this time? Because when you square numbers, you always get positives. So our Y values will always be positive. So it doesn't matter whether I plug three into this function or I plug negative three into that function, I'm always gonna get positive one ninth. Same thing for all of these. If I plug positive one fourth and or negative one fourth in this function, I'm going to get a positive 16. But what happens when you plug in zero? Zero squared is still zero. And so you have zero in your denominator, which is undefined. Okay, you can't have one over zero. It's not defined. So again, that the reason that that's undefined is because there is a vertical asymptote here. And if you notice the little ends, this little end and that little end, they're getting real close to that x-axis, but not touching it. So the x-axis is our horizontal asymptote. So same here, domain is gonna be negative infinity, almost to the x value zero, get real close, and then from almost zero toward positive infinity. The range though, there's nothing down here. So there's no negative y values. The range gets, the y value gets real close to zero, and then it goes up, up, up toward positive infinity, which is why the y values are from zero to positive infinity. Now on this side, if I trace it, it's going up. So it increases on this interval. 
And on this side, if I trace it, it's going downward. So it decreases on this interval. Again, you have that break in the gap, right? There's a little gap in there. Um, and it, that happens when the X is zero. Here again, our Y axis is our vertical asymptote and our X axis is our horizontal asymptote. Now this has an even exponent, so it makes it an even function. And we know that even functions are symmetric with respect to the Y axis. So if I folded it over that pink line, this side would land on that side. But again, this is just like extra bits of info. Chances are our functions are not going to be symmetric because they're going to be a lot different. Okay. So again, they kind of wanted you to um, use your transformations to try to figure this out. So that would have moved that graph. It would have taken this graph and it would have moved it to the left two and down one. And then you would have been able to draw it. Okay. But we're not going to do that because I'm going to show you like a general graphing technique that works on all of them, not just certain ones, okay? So here's where we get to finally formally define asymptotes. So I really don't like the way they defined it, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> since I don't like this expressions, but anyway, it says as y goes to infinity, whether it says absolute value because it means y could go to infinity or y can go to negative infinity. OK, so your y value will basically go up or it'll go all the way down when x approaches some number. OK, if that happens, then you're talking about a vertical asymptote, which is why they get real close to those vertical lines. Right, The graph comes up and it gets real close to it, but it never, never touches it. OK, or it could be coming whatever direction, but it could also be going downward and never like quite touching it. OK, those are the vertical asymptotes. Horizontal asymptotes are different. So you're talking about your X value going all the way toward negative infinity or all the way toward positive infinity. I don't know which way I'm, the picture thing is sometimes mirrored, but you're going toward the ends when X goes to infinity and negative infinity or positive infinity will be on the ends, but the Y value is going to some number, okay? If you're on top of the X axis, or if it's like trailing the y-axis, then that number is usually zero, okay? So it's always some line y equal to some number. Now, just remember that if you're talking about the x-axis, that's the equation y equals zero. And if you're talking about the y-axis, that is the equation x equal to zero. Now, key thing to know here is when they ask you for a vertical asymptote or y, a horizontal asymptote, you must type in an equation. It's a line. Lines are represented by equations. Lines are not represented by numbers, okay? So you can never tell me my vertical asymptote is at two. No, your vertical asymptote is at x equals two. Okay, so very technical there with the with the notation. Okay, so it's always going to be an equation. Anytime they ask you for an asymptote, it's going to be an equation. Now, how do you find them, right? Like, let's say I give you this really weird function. How do you find the vertical asymptote and how do you find the horizontal asymptote? Okay. Remember in the chart, I told you that those X values that were giving you undefined, that's where the vertical asymptotes were, right? And undefined only happens when your denominator is zero. So in order for me to find the vertical asymptotes, you that's exactly what you're doing is making your denominator equal to zero and then solving for X. And then once you solve for X, you will get your line or X equals a number. Right, that's what you end up with when you solve an equation. Now there are, it says other asymptotes instead of horizontal asymptotes, because there is a different kind of asymptote called an oblique or a slanted asymptote, but we don't cover those in um, this version of college algebra. They cover it in the pre-cal version of college algebra, but not this one, okay? So we won't be doing any oblique or slanted asymptotes. 
So just FYI on your homework, if it asks you a question, whether or not you have a horizontal or an oblique, you're never going to have an oblique in this class. So automatically you should outrule oblique or slanted. Okay. That's not going to happen. So it will be horizontal. Now, it'll either be horizontal or no horizontal. That's it, but never oblique. Now, when we're doing these, how do we know what the horizontal asymptote is going to be? And how do we know that it's horizontal versus this weird word oblique? Okay, and I'll write that word in here. It's the same thing. It means same thing. It just means instead of a horizontal line that I don't touch, it's like a diagonal line that I trail close to, but I don't touch, okay? Which it happens, but we're not gonna talk about them in this class, okay? So this is how you can tell. You have to look at the degrees. You have to look at the degree of the top of the fraction and the degree of the bottom of the fraction, okay? And depending on the relationship between those degrees, that's going to tell you what your your horizontal asymptote is or whether you don't have one, okay? So there's only three things that could possibly happen. Degree is the highest exponent, right? So the only three cases you can have is where the top exponent is smaller, and that's what this means. The degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. And if that's the case, your horizontal asymptote is automatically at y equals zero. There's nothing to compute, nothing to do. You just recognize, and now you know the y, the horizontal asymptote. The other kind of case you could have is once you look at those two numbers, maybe those two numbers are equivalent. And if they're equivalent, then you do have to do a little bit of something to figure out what the horizontal asymptote is, okay? If you look at this and this degree is the same as that degree, then your horizontal asymptote is gonna be at y equals this guy's coefficient over this guy's coefficient, okay? I write it a little bit different. I write LC for leading coefficient of the numerator and LC for leading coefficient of the denominator. That's just how I write it. You can write it however you want, um, but that only happens when the degrees are the same, okay? So you basically just take these numbers and that's your horizontal asymptote. Sometimes they reduce and sometimes they don't. Um, then the last possible thing that could happen with those numbers, the degrees, is that maybe your top degree is bigger than your bottom degree, okay? And if your numerator degree is bigger than your denominator degree, you probably have one of these or no, asympt no asymptote at all. But for us, we definitely have no horizontal asymptote, okay? So if this happens, there's just no horizontal asymptote. Okay, so we're gonna go to the next page. Again, I will post these so you get all of the notes. I think we'll be able to do these two problems, but that's probably all we'll be able to do, okay? Um, and if we don't get to both of them, that's okay. So for the first one, it's just saying find the vertical and horizontal asymptotes. We don't have these guys, okay? So for the vertical asymptotes, you have to set your denominator equal to zero. So in this case, I have to set this equal to zero. And I have to solve for x. So to do that, we use that zero factor property and we take that one equal to zero and then we take the other factor equal to zero. And if I solve this, I get X equal to one half as a vertical asymptote. And if I solve this one, I get negative three as my vertical asymptote. So my vertical asymptotes are at x equals one half and x equals negative three. Make sure you're typing the whole um, equations, not just half and negative three. For the horizontal asymptote, we have to look at those degrees. So we have to figure out what the degree of the numerator is, and we have to figure out what the degree of the denominator is. 
So what is the highest exponent in the numerator? It's like a little invisible one, right? And this one's tricky. What's the highest exponent in the denominator? Remember what we learned in the last section. You take that guy's exponent plus that guy's exponent and you can get the degree of the denominator. So one plus one is two. So I have a square. You also think about it, if you were to foil this out, you'd end up with two X squared in there, right? You'd end up with some X's and some constants too, but the highest exponent would have been a square. So now that we have the degrees, this is smaller than that. So we have the case where the numerator degree is smaller than the denominator degree. And in that case, it's supposed to automatically be at y equals zero. Now on the test, it's multiple choice. You have to be very careful because they'll say vertical asymptote and then one of the distractors will say y equals one half and y equals negative three. And then a horizontal asymptote will be x equals zero. And so it'll have all the same numbers that you got. And you'll be like real quick to click it, <laughs> but it's the wrong letters. So make sure you're paying attention that verticals should have x and horizontals should have y. Okay, be very, very careful with that. Let's see, we still have five minutes. Okay, cool. So we'll be able to finish this last, last one. That's all they wanted was the asymptotes. We don't have to graph them yet. So for our next problem, same steps. For the vertical asymptote, we'll take our denominator equal to zero, which is this guy. And if I solve that, I get x equals three. So that's my vertical asymptote. For the horizontal one, we have to look at those degrees, right? So the degree of the numerator is a little invisible one, and the degree of the denominator is a little invisible one. So in this case, they're actually the same. And when they're the same, we're supposed to have a horizontal asymptote at y equals the leading coefficient of the numerator over the leading coefficient of the denominator. Well, what is that in this case? The, if this is the guy with the highest exponent, two is his leading coefficient. And if this is the guy with the highest exponent at the bottom, his coefficient is actually the little invisible one. And you can reduce two over one, it's just two. So this would be my horizontal asymptote, okay? We'll talk about this one just briefly. Notice that here the degree of the numerator is two, right? You got the two exponent and down here there's none. So it's the degree of an invisible one. And in here, the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator. So in this case, you would say no horizontal asymptote if that happens in the homework, okay? You don't have to figure out what the slant or the oblique asymptote is. You just say there's no horizontal. It does still have a vertical asymptote though, right? If I take that denominator and equal it to zero, I do get the vertical asymptote of two, but it won't have any horizontals, okay? Let me just mark off this X because we ended up doing it anyway. Okay. Does anybody have any questions so far? If you came in while I was giving the announcement and you didn't hear it all, just make sure you watch the playback, especially at the beginning of it, so that you hear the announcement for the bonus points for test two, okay? Um, but if nobody has any questions, you guys are free to go, and I hope you have a good weekend, and I will see you on Tuesday. All right, bye, Miss. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye, you too. Bye, have a good weekend. You too.